honest, fresh, and captivating, this tale is yet another validation of Soldier's literary tenacity without compromising her raw sensibilities. I couldn't put this book down. Jada Pinkett Smith The Ultimate Ghetto Griot Only two classics into the game. This story is sparkly and seductive from the jump. Soldier is the biggie of the block-hugging book world. Vibe Magazine Sister Soldier's fans will enjoy this edgy tale of love and survival led by the provocative lead character. Ebony Shows the true grit of the New York's boroughs, the strength and determination of an immigrant family, and how, even in the concrete jungle, a rose can bloom. The book ends as if there will be a sequel. I hope there will be. Star Tribune, Minneapolis. Soldier's sensitive treatment of her protagonist is honest and affecting, with some realistic moments of crisis. Soldier has obvious talent and sincere motives, making her a street-lit sophomore worth watching. Publishers Weekly Hip-hop artist and master storyteller Soldier offers biting social critique on contemporary urban culture tucked inside a love story. Vanessa Bush A tour de force, Sister Soldier has led a generation back into reading books. Soldier clearly and forever stands as a major trendsetter. Chuck D. of Public Enemy Peace. Welcome to Ralph Reads. Brought to you by T-U-R-N, the United Ronin Networks. My name is Ralph Anthony Garcia, also known as R4. The legal, the loyal, the regal, the royal Ronin Ralph. Your master of ceremonies. Please like, share, comment, and subscribe. Tell a friend to tell a friend to tune in to T-U-R-N, the United Ronin Networks. We are Ronin. Today on Ralph Reads, I will continue with Midnight, a gangster love story, written by the incomparable Sister Soldier. Now it's the moment of relaxation as I move forward with this presentation. Let the reading commence. Chapter 6 Uma is my heartbeat. I love her more than I love myself. I care about what she thinks and what she has to say. Easily, I would give my life to save hers. Yet every day I strive to stay alive because losing my life would kill her. As Uma's firstborn and a son, we are closer than skin is to flesh. Without exchanging any words, I know many of her thoughts. Her feelings are extremely intense, so sometimes I have to leave her presence to avoid being swallowed by them. From age seven until now at fourteen, I've held her hand in mine and led her into America. I have translated everything she saw and heard. I've spoken for her in the offices of immigration, at the lawyer's office, at the bank and realtors. Every day I had to pay close attention to everyone, what they were saying and doing in regards to my mother, and had to read and interpret documents they wanted her to sign that were even difficult for me to understand. Ours is a closeness that only a foreigner in a foreign land who cannot speak the common language might really understand. Still, our closeness is more. Clearly, I know the difference between a father, a husband, and a son. I wanted to be the best son possible, not only because my father said to do it, not only because I am her only son, but also because she deserved it and I love and respect her beyond anyone else. Uma is the opposite of every female that I saw or knew so far in America. 
She doesn't change her mind every few seconds, minutes, or months. She is steady. Her love and loyalty are forever. Her friendship is something you can count on. She is a young wife and mother, and an extremely attractive woman without conceit. She doesn't need or want everyone to look at her or to give her compliments all day to feel all right about herself. She is an incredible cook who fills every one of her dishes and pots at every meal with love. After eating, you could feel the love growing in your belly and strengthening your body. She is a hard worker, but always pleasant. She is so smart, yet so unselfish. Even when she criticizes, she is accurate, but soft and always sweet. The best thing about her is her certainty. Her belief in and dedication to Allah is unshakable. You could see it in her every action every day without her preaching a word of it. Her family is her life. Uma's love for my father is like radiation, something active and extreme that's in each speck of the atmosphere every day. Since leaving the North Sudan, where Uma was born, raised, married, and gave birth, I do not mention her husband, my father, because mentioning missing him would set off a tidal wave of her emotions and desires and a typhoon of her tears that could only drown everyone and everything in its path. We live life like he is right here beside us in the United States. We bow down and pray to a lot together, at the same time, each time, every day. When we first touched down at JFK Airport in America, we were supposed to be received, cared for, and guided by one of my father's American friends, his former roommate while studying at Columbia University. We were both surprised when he never showed up and never responded to our many phone calls especially after my father phoned him from the Sudan and told him, I am sending my heart overseas. She is with my young son and carrying also my daughter in her womb. The roommate became permanently pressed in Uma's mind as the symbol of an American welcome and the measure of American friendship. On our first day in New York, once we made it outside of John F. Kennedy Airport in Queens, we took a taxi to New York City. We checked into a Midtown Manhattan hotel recommended by the cab driver. At the Parker Meridian, instantly, we became familiar with the weight of the American dollar as each night's stay in our hotel room equaled a month of Sudanese diners and high living. At the concierge's desk in the hotel lobby, I collected information and got a few answers to our questions, as well as a map of the city of New York, including all of its five boroughs and a subway guide. For a month, Uma and I lived in our hotel room, trying to figure things out. We walked the streets and learned to ride the train together, making and carrying out our plans. It wasn't long before Uma revealed that the shock of this new place and the weird people and things we saw every day were making her sicker than she was supposed to be in her third month of pregnancy. On the train, she would comment to me that the women in this country must all be in mourning because they wore no henna on their hands. Back home, women with undecorated hands and feet were either unmarried, uncelebrated, or widowed. Hannah was a sign of happiness, good fortune, good health, good life, and beauty. The train rides were a source of shock for her, singing beggars with either no legs or no arms or both, foul-mouthed youth who wouldn't stand up and make room for elderly ladies or women traveling with babies and young children. Once there was this man in his thirties, drenched in the smell of cheap wine, who attempted to stand directly in front of where Uma sat before I moved him out of the way. The last straw was when a homeless man seated beside us turned out to be dead. Two young transit workers got onto the train, then stood around arguing who was gonna clean up the pool of watery shit.
act that filled the seat after his body was removed. While shopping in the random fruit stores, Uma would say that the fruits here looked abnormal and strangely large. So many of the fresh tropical fruits she craved were missing from the midtown stores like dates, guava, tamarind, and apricots. In the supermarkets we checked out, she would say that the raw chicken looked bloated and swollen and unusually yellow, as if someone had intentionally painted them with an unnatural color. In the fish market, she will recoil at the stinking smell, saying fresh fish has a distinctive scent but did not have a foul odor. Even the coffee served in the coffee shops was an insult to her. I guess this was not surprising, since Sudanese coffee ranks as one of the best tasting coffees prepared in the world. Uma spit up even the New York drinking water, saying it was awful and tasted impure. I never doubted her words. On our estate, our water was drawn from our fresh water wells. Back home, she picked fruits off of our trees, plucked and pulled vegetables from our gardens and fields, crushed fresh coffee beans, fried them, and brewed everyone's coffee. She cooked incredible stews and baked fresh breads and was so accurate in her mixture and blend of spices that an invitation for dinner at our place was never turned down, but instead was met with great excitement and anticipation. I knew, and Uma impressed upon me, that we had to find affordable housing and a comfortable living space before our monies dwindled down to nothing. So far, we had spoken with many professionals who were all clear and specific about the money they wanted from us as payment. Yet they were cloudy and vague about what they would actually do to earn the money they were requesting and quick to add that they could not guarantee us any results. Uma sensed they were liars and cheaters under the banner of business. Most things we were left to figure out for ourselves. The urgency pushed me to ask Uma to relax in the hotel room and venture out on my own. I listened as she recited a list of things she wanted and we needed. I put some of our money into my pocket, then I left to go make it happen. In the evenings, I would return and give her the items I had purchased. Also, I gave her an update on some of the things that happened in my day, careful not to mention anything that would disturb or upset her or cause her to know how people here tried to boss and cheat a young kid as if I couldn't count or think straight. Brooklyn is where I discovered a row of Arab-owned stores where the spices Uma cooked with back home were available for sale. Cardamom, ginger, turmeric, coriander, cumin, cayenne, mustard seeds, fennel, and a host of hot peppers. There were dates, tamarinds, apricots, eggplant, okra, lentils, and chickpeas. There was an assortment of Middle Eastern and African flowers, which she would use to prepare our breads. They even had a barrel of pumpkin seeds. I picked up a bag as a treat for Uma, who ate and enjoyed them back home from time to time. When I brought my info and a few treats back to the hotel and spoke of the row of Arab-owned stores, a supermarket, a takeout falafel shop, a jewelry store, and a mosque, Uma wanted to see those places for herself, so she chose to explore the Brooklyn Mosque first. When we entered, an Arab man greeted me and ignored her. When I asked if we could make prayer, he welcomed me and pointed Uma toward a closet door which led to a dark, damp basement area where women were designated to pray separately from the men. We were used to men and women praying separately in one space, women behind the men. It was the cold winter season outside and colder in the dungeon. It was unsuitable for any woman, especially a pregnant one. He expected Uma to go down there alone. I grabbed her hand to escort her out of there. Uma turned to the Arab man and, speaking in Arabic, stated, Do you think that because you're in America that Allah cannot see you and what you are doing?
He seemed surprised that we spoke his language. He never answered a question, though. As we left, Uma said, America, where Muslims play and do what they would never do back home. Now she was content to keep our prayers privately. She never asked about the local mosques again. Brooklyn was also the place where I discovered a bookstore that let me order books printed in Arabic. It was a rainy day. I was amazed at the unfamiliar combination of cold temperature and the freezing downpour of ice water onto my shoulders and back. I stepped under the canopy of one of those stores and stood shivering and facing a bookstore named The Open Mind, built on the triangular tip of two intersecting blocks. I shot across the street and entered a place with thousands of books for sale in a tight maze of tall shelves. Aside from the books, the place appeared to be empty. As I looked around at the headings, mysteries, biographies, hobbies, adults only, entrepreneurs, magazines, and children's, I was interrupted by a short Jewish man wearing wire-framed glasses and a mustache. He folded his arms across his chest like some adults do when they are trying to establish authority over a child. I didn't respond to it because I didn't look at him as a parent or guardian over me. No school today, he asked. I ignored his question and treated him like a bookseller because that is what he was. If he was a good one, I was planning to be a book buyer. Do you have the book series called The Amazing Adventures of Akbar? I asked. He repeated the name of the series aloud and scrunched up his face like he was trying to solve a difficult math problem. I have a children's section over there to the left, but I don't think I ever heard of this series, he admitted. Thanks anyway. I turned to leave. Wait, he said, calling behind me. I can order the books for you if you like. I must have looked skeptical because he continued to try to convince me. Ten days to two weeks, I'll have them right here in my store for you, he said. Do you know the name of the author? Yes, it's Bashir Hussein. The series is written in Arabic, I told him. His face lit up. Where are you from, he asked. Where are you from? I turned the question around on him. No, really, he asked me again. I just came from the number two train, I answered him. He smiled, unfolded his arms, and threw up his hands saying, Bravo! Okay, kid, you win. I see you're a tough one, but you like books, so I like you. Come back in two weeks, and I will have your series for you. If not, then I'm not Marty Bookbinder. He held out his hand to me. I shook it. Two weeks later, when I returned to the open mind, I entered the store and walked around quietly, wondering how this guy survived in this business when I had yet to see him with a customer besides myself. I saw him shoot past me in the maze of shelves without acknowledging that I was standing there. I took that to mean he did not get the books I ordered and didn't feel like facing me. I turned to walk out. He shouted after me, Hey, I got your series! Surprised, I turned back around and followed him to the section where he kept the new book shelved. Naturally, I smiled as I saw volumes 1 through 21 of the series my father first chose for me right there in front of my face in this foreign land. I'll take volumes 15 through 21, I told Marty. That's seven books, he said to me. I thought it was a dumb comment that implied I either did not know that already or could not count for myself. Each book is seven fifty, he said. I put $52.50 on the counter plus 8% sales tax. Put them in the bag, please, I said. What about the other volumes, he asked. I picked up my bag and answered, I read them already. I left the store thinking of how much I hate to be underestimated. Wait a minute, he followed me. What's your name, he asked. Maybe next time, I told him. That's an interesting name, he laughed. Listen, please come again. I'll teach you how to play chess. Do you play chess, he asked. Chess? Maybe next time, I said again. Down that same block, I found a friendly Jewish realtor. I explained to her that my mother didn't speak any English. 
but we were looking for a place to stay. She was the one who eventually led Uma and me to the Brooklyn Projects into a three-bedroom apartment on the sixth floor. She showed it to us like it was the ideal place for the ideal price. She charged us three months' rent in advance. Somehow, only two months' worth of the money we gave her counted. The third month's rent, she said, was her fee for locating the apartment for us. The bottom line was we were never suspicious that the realtor had led us into a hell reserved for poor blacks. We didn't know about the crime rate, the condition of African Americans, hostile policing, illegal drugs, welfare, food stamps, or Medicaid. All we knew was the monthly rental price was an amount that we could afford to pay without Uma having to work for the first year while she gave birth to and began breastfeeding and raising the baby who my father assured us was a daughter. With the keys to our new apartment in my hands, I went in and scrubbed the walls, toilet, and tub with Dettol. I swept, washed, and waxed the floors in every room. I cleaned all the windows. I taught myself how to use the stove and oven. I cleaned it out as well as the refrigerator. The job took so long to complete that I never made it back to the hotel where Uma was hand-washing and hang-drying her favorite clothes and packing our few belongings. She did not trust the hotel laundress to do the job. I spent my first night alone in the apartment with the windows slightly open so the cool breeze would clear out the antiseptic smell of all the detergents. On the hard, newly sparkling floor, I lay down and listened to the sounds and noises of elevator doors opening and closing, my neighbors walking and children running through the hallways and even more milling in the streets. Lying there with a view of a starless sky as black as ink, I thought about my southern Sudanese grandfather. I had learned not to fear the darkness and the unknown, spending summers side by side the boys of his village, learning and playing and training with more than twenty or so boys my age gave me crazy confidence. When we would hear the sounds of the creatures of the night, we did not fear. They had a crew and we had a crew. We knew from watching the boys who were older than us that if we worked together, we would rule over the animals instead of them ruling over us. I felt extra secure in this village. After all, my own father was born and raised there, and my grandfather was the only man greater than him. My grandfather taught me to see in the dark, not just to look, but to see. He would sit so still in the dark of the African night. He was so black that only a trained eye could distinguish him from the atmosphere, so he would play on it. I would walk into his large hut. He would have the lamps off on purpose. I would move around feeling as though I was completely alone in there. Suddenly, he would grab me with his rough hands. His deep voice would fill the room. When he would laugh at my foolishness in not being able to see him, only his white sparkling teeth will reveal his actual location. What if I were the King Cobra? He would ask with the threat animated in his voice. He played these games with me until I learned to pay attention, to see in the dark, to not bump into anything in my surroundings because I needed to form a mental picture of it. Since Uma was asleep alone in the hotel, I made sure I was back in Manhattan by the time she opened her eyes and in time for prayer. Dialing the combination that unlocked the hotel safe, I took Uma's jewels, then the few we managed to bring from back home, and wrapped them in one of her colorful silk scarves. I carried them on my back, secured in my backpack. She f in her room. She would be writing furiously. She would stop the instant I appeared. She would put her papers to the side or in a drawer and not speak on it. I was not concerned about the content of her writings. It was only her I was concerned about, 
her feelings, and exactly how to make a true smile spread across her face again, as it always had back home. Very soon, Uma confided to me that she would have to find a job. At the same time, she wanted to sign me up to start in an American school, but she also realized that she could not do both. She needed me to help her search for a job. She needed me to speak English to them and translate their English back to her. I was against the idea of her working while carrying my sister. I felt my father would not like it either. But if she was going to be traveling outside to meet potential employers, I was definitely going along with her. So when she was six and a half months pregnant, I found a job for Uma working at a fabric factory, a building located inside a group of warehouses where women, most of them foreign, worked on industrial machines lined up in rows. I spoke to the manager there who offered Uma part-time work due to her pregnancy at $3 per hour. He said if Uma was good, she could be bumped up to full-time after she gave birth. I liked that there were mostly women working there on the floor where all the sewing was being done. I did not like that all the bosses were men. Back home, Uma's clothing business was run from top to bottom exclusively by African women. The best part about the Russian board Israelis who ran the factory was that they didn't make a big deal about Uma's Islamic attire. And when I explained that Uma couldn't speak English, one of the bosses asked, Does this look like a talking place to you? Show up on time, work fast, and work hard, that's it. So I escorted Uma to the factory each time she went, and picked her up at the end of every workday. We rode the trains together. At work and in public, she remained covered from head to toe, beneath a hijab and behind a niqab veil. No one could see her except me. Her modest clothing gave me a chance to grow up without having to fight grown men all day, every day. Her modest clothing kept me from having to hurt anybody, especially on my Brooklyn block. My sister Naja was born in the Brooklyn hospital that some fool had the good mind to name the King's County Hospital, a place where no one was treated royal. Uma was left alone in a room lying down with impatient and unprofessional healthcare workers, angry that she could not speak English and bent on keeping me, her translator, in a separate area. As I pressed them at the front desk to call the doctor, one nasty lady pointed her fat, crooked finger at me and said, Do you see all these people out here? I did see them. Tens of them, lying on tables, some in rooms, others pushed against the walls and lined up in the hallways. Some of these people have been shot. Has your mother been shot? She asked me with a monster mug face. No, alhamdulillah, I answered, meaning, no, Uma has not been shot, thank Allah. La, la, la. Living in Brooklyn, I had seen guns being aimed and triggers being pulled and shots being fired and gangsters and thieves and pimps and shootouts, but nothing was scarier than this woman's hatred and disregard for human life. Why couldn't she understand what Uma was going through? She was a woman too. Then I decided that she was really nothing but an empty shell with a booming voice and hole where the heart is supposed to be. I could not imagine that she had ever been anybody's mother or friend. So she has to wait then. The doctor would see the most important cases first. My sister didn't wait. Uma was drenched in sweat when she burst out. Uma jumped off the table and caught her before the eight-pound body could hit the floor. Later, I found out that the monster lady was not even a nurse. Somehow, someone in America had given out colorful medical jackets to the most uneducated, untrained people in the world and left them there to care for the sick and newborn. A real nurse showed up eventually and said that Uma should have been under a doctor's care throughout her entire pregnancy. She blamed Uma and covered for the crazy lady who yelled at us, explaining that we showed up at the wrong door of the hospital. 
Uma said, we will have to take good care of ourselves and my newly born sister Naja to make sure that we all remain healthy. Otherwise, Uma explained, we will fall victim to the American hospital, which should be called the American Morgue. The first day we carried Naja to the apartment was the first day we received a real visit from a neighbor. She was named Miss Marcy. We already knew her because she was an elderly lady who I once helped to carry her groceries inside the building. Uma said that old people are always attracted to babies. Through me, Miss Marcy asked about Naja often. Sometimes she invited Uma over for small talks and hot drinks. Since Uma could not really communicate with Miss Marcy, we knew she really wanted to spend time with the baby. Uma accepted Miss Marcy as her only neighborhood acquaintance. She said she missed the wisdom, warmth, and love of the elders that she once had back home. Eventually, Miss Marcy became the only person in our hood allowed to see and care for my infant sister, Naja. At home, I assisted in every way possible. I thought it was amazing, this newborn life. Since all we had was each other, I learned more about infants than I ever would have back home. In the Sudan, our newborns are surrounded by aunties and a host of women of every age who handle everything. Where I am from, a male will usually never interfere in the areas that the women control and are better suited for. When Uma was breastfeeding Naja once, I asked her what was she thinking when she was in the hospital lying on her back and felt Naja flying out. She said, I didn't think at all. It was a mother's instinct, and catching Naja was the same as catching myself. Uma and I grew closer every day and depended on each other and no one else. We made up certain rules between us and even had an emergency plan if anything seemed to have happened to one of us. In our rooms, both of us always kept one piece of packed luggage in case we suddenly had to make a move. We weren't expecting anything bad to happen, but we both learned that things do happen, even when you don't expect it. When Uma, Naja, and I were inside our Brooklyn apartment, we were inside our own little Sudanese world. We adjusted and trusted and believed only in us three. There was only love in there. What went on outside our door, we tolerated, dealt with, and handled. I kept my fury for the streets. Inside, we were determined to maintain our traditions, ways of being, and doing and we were steadfast in our Islam. Chapter 7 Getting money and getting killed seemed like one and the same around my way. Every male I saw getting money ran the risk of losing his life and freedom, and many of them did the way I saw it. If you lost your freedom, you lost your life anyhow, because then you really can't get no money. In two years' time, I counted 20 male teens dead. Twelve had actually lost their lives. The remaining eight were hauled off in police cars, heads pushed down by the palm of some questionable cop's hand, cuffed and carted away for a long, long time. And this was only in my building. I didn't count the dead from the other side of my block. It was crazy how they left the yellow tape on the walkway, tracing out the body of Daquan's dead little brother De Leon, the asthmatic one. He got popped on the block at age 15. Someone spray-painted the outline of his corpse and drew a mural on the ground in his name that read, Only the strong survive. I looked down at it one day and figured his brothers blamed him for not being gangster enough to stay alive. Another time, two teens had lost their lives throwing a party around our way in the tiny rec center. They was trying to make some money. One was an MC, the other was his DJ. Now they just dead. They brought my building body count to 22 in two years. In four years, the count exploded to 46. 
Getting money was usually the reason or somebody jealous that somebody was getting money or somebody stealing money or the cops shutting people down because they don't want nobody around here making money or just because they felt like it. We made quiet money, Uma and me. It was strange to us how an American salary was so much more than a Sudanese salary, yet American workers remained poor. It was strange remembering how Uma's employees back home earned so much less money, but had so much more. Swiftly we realized that a salary here meant next to nothing. We needed to have a business of our own. Together we decided to build the business most familiar to Uma, modeled on the one she built and operated back home, but on a much smaller startup level. I had faith it would work. I knew that there were very few people who can do what Uma does the way she does it. Once people found out about her products, there would be a demand, I thought. Every day after work, Uma would be telling me her ideas for improving her workplace, including introducing new methods and products. She pointed out that the factory had more advanced machinery and a larger operating budget than she ever had back home. But they worked with a simple and lower quality fabric and cracked down garments with limited, unexciting patterns and designs. On the flip side, Uma was an expert in textiles and designs and could make everything beautiful. She knew all that a person could know about fabrics, cotton, linen, silk, wool, seersucker, jute, leather, suede, their grain, grade, and quality. She also knew about coloring, blends, and dyes. She was so nice with her fingers that she could stitch elegant patterns and pictures on brocades and do embroidery of intricate original designs on cloth, clothing, and upholstery. When she was bored, she crocheted and knitted beautiful blankets, sweaters, scarves, gloves, hats, and clothing. All of our beds at home were draped in her work. She told me she began sewing and stitching at age five. She loved creating designs and clothing, but said that her greatest accomplishment was a Sudanese carpet she made from an elaborate design she saw in her mind. It was the only carpet she had ever designed and woven in her lifetime. I recommended that instead of her trying to get me to translate her suggestions to management in an effort to move up in their company, she should keep her ideas to herself and we should start our own hustle on American soil. At first, Uma was skeptical. To earn her factory pennies, she already worked long, hard hours, sometimes randomly being required to do double shifts. She knew the possibility existed of making money in a private business. Yet, after she received the huge hospital bills for the birth of nausea, which she had to pay on her own, she really valued the limited health insurance we were now receiving from what became her full-time factory job. It offered a financial cushion, and she was afraid to lose it. Also back home, she had a huge family and friends and community to draw her customers and contacts from. In the U.S., she felt anonymous and isolated. But I was confident and certain about Uma. Besides, I was right there to help out in every way. To encourage her, I had 100 Uma Designs business cards printed up at a local print shop. When I pushed the cardboard box over to her side of the table, she opened it up and read the card, smiled, then cried. Uma makes everything beautiful, was the slogan I had embossed in gold script beneath the company name. She could not even read the English words printed on the cards, but she saw and recognized her name on the card and understood my intent, which meant even more. We learned fast that just having the business cards did not guarantee us any business. Our breakthrough happened when one of Uma's co-workers, a pregnant black woman with a British accent, approached me as I waited one day outside of the factory for Uma to come out. You're Salah's son, isn't it? She asked. It's great how I see you waiting here for each and every day. I wish my son was so good. Anyway, I'd like to invite your mom to my baby shower. Here's the invite. You make sure she understands. Good enough? She looked tired, but she was smiling. 
What is a baby shower? I asked, unfamiliar with this kind of event. She laughed and answered, It's for the ladies to get together and celebrate the baby that's coming. She rubbed her belly. Your mom doesn't have to, but most guys bring gifts for the baby. Okay, thanks, she said, waddling off. I'm sure I seemed calm and cool to the woman, but really, I was excited. I convinced Uma to attend the shower, even though there was a language barrier. I explained to her that this was her perfect chance to show her work. She should look her best and design and sew the most beautiful gifts for the unborn baby. Maybe even for the baby's mother. It was a woman's event, so she could get comfortable, unveil, and display everything. I was positive the woman would all admire Uma and everything she wore and made. Meanwhile, as the women exited the shower, I would be seated right outside with the business cards, pen and paper in hand, ready to catch our first customer's orders. On the way to the shower, packed tightly in the back seat of the Brooklyn taxi cab, I pulled out seven of my mother's gold bangles and her exquisite jewelry that we usually kept stored away. I placed each one on her right wrist as she caressed Naja with her free hand. The driver jammed on both the gas pedal and then his brakes, dodging traffic. Instead of Uma speaking to me, she was thinking to herself. I knew an emotion stirred in her because she had not worn jewelry since we lived in America. She no longer saw the need to decorate herself since she was out of the presence of my father. Today, however, underneath the beautiful cloth of her robe, she wore a handmade dress with amazing embroidery stitched from the neckline to the hemline. She carried nausea in a handmade satchel with embroidery that complemented her dress. Before stepping out of the cab, I helped her slip out of her flat walking shoes into a pair of gold leather heels. She had not worn these either while living in America, but I selected them especially for this day. I carried the gifts in one shopping bag and her samples in the other. We ended up walking eight flights of stairs because the elevator in the woman's building was broken. I got worried that maybe these women wouldn't have the money to order anything. Then I pushed the thought out of my head because in my building, all the broke people dress the best. I handed the woman the shopping bag stuffed with gifts. She screamed in delight. Bloody God, you shouldn't have! I didn't understand her comment. I handed Uma the other shopping bag and said in Arabic, I'll be waiting outside here until you're finished. The woman invited me to stay as she saw me leaving. I thanked her and left anyway. Four or five hours later, the women one by one slowly exited the shower. They were all smiling and upbeat. I handed each of them our business card, explaining that Uma made everything by hand, and if they wanted to place an order, they could call the telephone number on the card. About eight of the women must have been the British lady's friends and relatives because I did not recognize them from the factory. Meanwhile, I told Uma's co-workers they could also speak their order to me any weekday after work when I came to meet Uma. When Uma finally came out, the British hostess and a small group of ladies were each thanking and hugging her and showering Naja with compliments and attention. It was the first time there wasn't the formalities and distance between them that there was at the factory, where Uma stayed covered and veiled and unusual because of the male presence. Now, they had all seen Uma, the elegant woman, her face kissed by Allah, her beautiful hands that made beautiful clothing, her authentic jewels, and her very calm and lovable baby girl. The bottom line was the co-workers were all used to seeing one another. Seeing Uma, really seeing her today for the first time, was a highlight. I could tell that they all had been affected, especially by her genuine, warm, and pretty smile. I carried Uma's first American Singer sewing machine to our apartment from a used appliance shop. I took her shopping in Manhattan's garment district and carried her newly purchased supplies. I received our first customer orders that same week. There were women who ordered that exact same blanket that your mother crocheted for the baby, the same beautiful dress your mother wore to the shower, 
but in my size. Ten of those baby satchels, but in a variety of solid colors, so I can sell them to my friends, etc. Something unique for my niece. I like the way your mother designed the clothes for the baby. It was so personal. Etc, etc, etc. Now, Uma realized that most of her co-workers could work the machinery at the factory, but really did not have magical fingers like she did. If they did, would they get so pumped up on the items she made that they were willing to part with their hard-earned bucks? Everyone communicated their orders to me. I established the rates and requested and collected the deposits. I even hooked some ladies up once they explained their concept of layaway, quote-unquote. When their items were completed, I delivered them and collected the balance. I became known for my good manners, nice way of talking, for being on time, honest, and reliable. All of the customers were women, although some were ordering items for men. They expressed their gratitude to me by offering tips. Tips were small, but they added up. On the American holidays, my tips doubled because customers tended to spend like crazy. Eventually, customers began phoning who were friends of friends of co-workers. I brought an answering machine to keep all the orders organized. I put my voice on the greeting and sometimes bugged out on the various accents, requests, and types of messages when I played them back at night in my room. I ordered a second phone line to be installed for Uma's personal use. We never told anyone our home address. It was not on the business card. If special measurements had to be taken, which was unusual, we will make an appointment and show up to the customer's place. We purposely never advertised or solicited any customers in our own neighborhood or building. We kept our money quiet. Nobody knew we got it or how we got it. My part in the business may sound easy, yet there were risks involved. I delivered anywhere that a customer lived and never said no to any address or location. Some of the places were dangerous and f***ed up. America, or at least the state of New York, was divided into separate areas. A lot of people were tribal and territorial. Some fools seemed to believe that if you weren't from a certain area, you couldn't enter or walk through that area. Some people thought their buildings were off-limits. Some people believed that kids were easy targets, like the two guys who hid in the corners down the subway, then came at me from two sides, surprising me, then jamming me in the turnstile. They didn't get nothing. I dropped down and rolled out. In just a borough of Brooklyn, you could get hemmed up by black American youth or angry mobs of young whites and sometimes even their parents. You could get chased out by territorial and suspicious Jews who sometimes had their own private patrols and community rules. Even some of the real religious ones considered their neighborhoods exclusive. I handled all of that and the other boroughs as well. I had to keep the product nice, neat, and in the same condition that Uma packaged it in. I purchased a high-end North Face backpack from Paragon, a sporting goods and mountain gear boutique in Manhattan. I also brought garment bags in bulk from the garment district to use when the orders were large. I made sure I expressed our appreciation to each customer and even provided handwritten receipts. I kept my 22 on me to defend our profits. Uma sewed deep pockets into my jeans and khakis, jackets and coats. I asked her to so I could carefully conceal my joint plus my knives. She knew I had weapons. Where we are from, a man is supposed to be armed to defend his family. She never tried to be an obstacle to my manhood. Even when I showed up with wounds, cuts or bruises, she just cleaned them up and asked no questions. The same way she related to my father. Uma opened her first bank account with my translation assistance. We placed half of her cash in the bank. We hid one-fourth of the cash in a secret location just in case. I kept one-fourth of the cash in my room for business operating costs, like extra supplies and transportation fees or the phone bill and such. My tips were a separate matter. I started storing them in tin cans that used to hold tea leaves. 
After filling eight of them, I had to upgrade to huge coin jars, which I filled and placed in the back of my clothing closet. Pennies, nickels, dimes, quarters, all in their own jars. I marked each jar as it filled up to keep the count. Small tips were adding up. Inside of my volumes of The Amazing Adventures of Akbar, I kept my clean double-digit paper dollars neatly arranged and pressed. As time pushed on, Uma upgraded our business in several ways. We developed a much bigger client list of paying customers who had nothing to do with the factory where she worked. Through word of mouth, or should I say the precision of her skills in making women dress and feel better, she received a big order from one woman who wanted Uma to design everything she wore. The woman had deep pockets and never haggled about our mushrooming prices. She attracted a few wealthy friends of hers to our business but never allowed us to meet them. She made their orders run through her. With more money to invest back into the business, I improved our packaging to make the products more appealing. Uma introduced colorful tissue papers for wrapping each item, some solids, some fluorescent, some paisley, all interesting and different. She added a line of scented clothing using a tradition from back home in the Sudan where women draped their cloths in the closed-in room where homemade incense was burning, making everything they wore smell delicious and leaving an alluring trail wherever they went. Slowly and carefully, Uma began making her secret homemade perfume potions and placing them in small crystal bottles for sale to exclusive customers and as a gift to returning customers who spent more than $300 with each order. I was impressed with her and completely dedicated. Everything that she did naturally as a woman was saving our family. She was my father's private treasure and wife, and people were willing to pay to get even a small item that she touched up, or an ounce of her everyday aroma, or a duplicate of her personal style, or anything that resembled her elegance. Chapter 8 Funny thing is, when people support you in business, even though you have given them a great product in exchange for their money, they want you and your business to support them in other ways, too. So, when one of my mother's clients organized a bus trip to an upstate New York farm for apple picking and purchasing fresh plucked vegetables and fresh squeezed juices, Uma decided that our family would attend. Although we had come to the United States years before, it was our first trip outside of our hood and our five-borough business area. Two and a half hours into the trip, we exited the highways and the rural countryside appeared on the other side of our bus window, presenting me with a picture completely different than my Brooklyn urban view. There were enormous trees with multicolored leaves that were part green, red, orange, and yellow. They floated down from the tree branches and danced to the ground where they formed waist-high piles on some narrow roads. We were surrounded by the colors of autumn. There were houses, none of them masterpieces of architecture, but sitting on land with large spaces between them. There were broken-down barns and cows and sheep and goats and horses. Four-year-old Naja was fascinated with these animals, which she was seeing for the first time in her life. Her little face and hands were pressed against the glass. Uma was excited and relaxed, speaking softly and explaining everything to Naja in Arabic. Naja would speak Arabic to Uma and then turn to ask questions in English to me. As the bus bumped up a long rocky dirt road and onto the farm, the women put away their snacks and sandwiches, cleaned their children's hands and faces, and walked off the bus and onto the farm together. I told Uma I would meet them back on the farm in an hour. One of the few males on the trip, I prefer to take a look around this completely new area. On the paved black road with no sidewalks or curbs, I kicked through a pile of leaves. 
Walking alone on the road, seeing no one, nowhere, I stopped, then stood still. I wasn't losing my mind. On my Brooklyn block standing still was a luxury I couldn't afford. I looked up through the trees and into the skies. The sun was beaming through the colored leaves and small open spaces, creating a kaleidoscope. I listened to the sounds of nature the way we used to back home in my grandfather's village. I could hear the subtle sounds of the mosquitoes, knowing they were dying out for the season. I could hear the music of the birds flying south. I could hear the wind breezing through the grass. I could hear the deep moan of the cows and stutter of the goats. A mile down the road, I came upon a horse farm. About eight of them were grazing on some grass behind a rusted barbed wire fence. I stopped to take a good look at one of them that stood about fifteen feet from me. Horses are big and imposing creatures. I couldn't even imagine what Allah was thinking when he created them. Allah is the ultimate designer, I thought. How amazing to think up and then bring into existence thousands of different kinds of creatures, each one unique and awesome on its own. Look at the difference between a horse and a camel, I thought to myself. The horse's skin was more smooth and tight, its body more streamlined. Allah filled the horse's eyes with mystery. It seemed like they knew something that humans didn't know. Yet, there was no real way for a human to decipher what a horse was thinking and feeling. I laughed at myself, ten minutes in the countryside, and my thoughts were filled with Allah. Back home in my building, I can only feel Allah in my prayers, but not in my surroundings and never outside of our apartment. When I looked down at the plants, I thought of my father, a scientist. He would know something about each of these plants, not just about their beauty, but their use. He could also look at a field that others would describe as being empty and create a vision in his mind of what it could be, then make it happen. I saw him do that before, back home. He brought me with him to areas that his business developed. Soon I arrived at a plot of land that had a house for sale. There were no curtains, shades, or blinds in any of the windows. From where I was, it appeared to be empty. I wondered if I could stand to live out here. I had spent summers in my grandfather's village, but it was not only the nature that made it great. It was the people, the brothers and sisters, the cousins, friends, relatives, that made it incredible. It was the music, the gatherings, the talks, the sports, and even the work that made it a life. I pulled my pen and pad out from my army green jacket and jotted down the telephone number of the realtor. If anything, I just wanted to call and find out how much a piece of property out here would actually cost. The path and push through the antique door with the we're open sign hanging from one rusty tack. It had been cool outside, but was mad hot in here. It was a blacksmith shop with one big older white man covered in black grease banging what looked like a heavy all-metal hammer on a piece of iron. Then poking the iron into the open oven shimmering with intense heat and orange flames. You need some horseshoes? The teenage boy who emerged from the corner asked me. Nah, I answered. Then what you come around here for? He asked me in an unfamiliar accent. Just looking, I told him. My eyes taking in all of the iron and steel, the intense fire and heavy tools. I wondered to myself, why horseshoes? The place seemed like it had the right equipment and tools and was the perfect place to make weapons. Where are you from? The youth asked me. His father or boss kept working. Just visiting the apple farm four miles down, I answered without giving up real info. Yeah, I know the place, he said casually. Let me show you something, I said as I reached into my pocket and pulled out a small book I had been reading. He stepped up closer to take a look. I went to page 66, which had an illustration of a Japanese shuriken, a wicked ass knife that I wanted. Do you think you can make one of these? I asked him. 
He took my book into his hands and got a spot of black grease on the page and answered, Yup, we could. What you want it for? I ignored his question. If I ordered the set, how much would it cost me? He looked back at the older man, who aside from a quick glance didn't seem interested at all. I could do it for you. A set of four for a honey. But I knew that the older guy would be a better craftsman. I was concerned about the quality and the dynamics of the knives. I wanted them to be exact. Nah, nah. I'd rather him do it, I nodded to point out the older guy. The boy laughed, a little insulted. He'll double the price, he warned. I creased the page and tore it from my book. I handed him the page with a hundred dollar bill and a fifty percent deposit on double the price. How long before he can have it ready? I asked. Couple of days, he answered. I'll be back to pick him up. Hold him for me, I told him firmly. You better come back. Once my father works the iron, you gotta pay up in full. Can't get no deposit money back if you change your mind, he threatened. I seen he needed to feel like a boss over me, the customer. I wanted the product, so I played along with it. Here's 50 more. Just let him do a good job on it, I said calmly. Now that more money was changing hands, I saw the youth's father paying attention. Uma, Naja, and I made the Zor prayer on the farm right before sunset with the violet sky as our ceiling and the trees as our walls. It felt completely peaceful. The passengers on the bus waited eight extra minutes for us. When we raised from our prayers, we could see them watching us through the windows. When we boarded, they all had odd-looking expressions on their faces as we walked down the aisle. Maybe they never seen the family pray before. I don't know. Thirty minutes into the ride, they loosened up and were back to acting normal, eating apples, playing cards, kids clapping, and an older lady passing around a hat to take up a collection to tip the bus driver. I thought to myself, maybe these people thought that we were strange. It didn't matter, though, because after the prayer, they definitely showed us respect. What started out as a bother and an obligation turned out to be a great trip. At first, Uma and I worried about losing an entire Saturday, which was the biggest work day for her side business. Now we not only got some fresh vegetables and fruits that grew up from the ground and hung from the trees and were picked by Uma's hand the way she liked it, I also had a lead on the house for sale. When I gave the realtor a call that same week, at first he didn't want to talk to a kid, quote-unquote, on the telephone. I was 12. I told him my parents didn't speak any English and that I was translating for them. He switched from being angered to only being a bit impatient. He priced the house at $62,000. He also offered to sell us the empty plot of land beside it for $20,000. Through Uma Designs, in two years, we banked $24,000. We agreed that when we had enough money to walk in and buy a whole house and the land it sat on, we would disappear from our Brooklyn block quietly. No one would know where we had gone, why, or most important, how. The shuriken turned out sweet. There were curved knives with a fist grip. One graceful swipe at a neck at the right angle, and the head comes off. Chapter 9 A problem did come like I knew it would. I didn't know what it would be, or who it would be. But based on my father's words and lessons, it would happen. His name was Gold Star Tafari. He showed up in the parking lot outside the factory where Uma worked. A dark cat like me, he seemed about 29, 30 years old. He had a rough face that you could tell was etched by experience. A medium build, he was about 2 inches taller than me at 13. He had two cuts on his left cheek that looked mean. 
I always liked scars. They belong on men as a reminder. If you ask a male about his wounds, usually he'll tell a good, crazy, original, and action-packed story. Once a youth starts collecting scars, it makes him a better fighter, smarter with his moves, in his next encounter. He had locks, long, wild black ones that he made sure not to organize, just wore naturally. He was the first cat I noticed rocking the Star David piece on his chain and clenching a gold toothpick holder between the top and bottom rows of his teeth. He showed up at the factory suddenly. It was a Monday, a cold winter evening, 5 p.m. to be exact. Already I could see the gray sky that comes before the black. You know how the sun rises late and sets real early in the midwinter season? There was a steady flow of nine-to-five workers getting off and walking through the parking area like they did at the end of each workday. Most of them didn't have cars. He drove up, parked, got out, stood, and began looking in my direction. I was checking out the fact that he was wearing a hat made by Uma Designs. It was crocheted with Uma's special stitching using ice green, black, and gold yarn. It didn't even take me ten seconds to run through the orders in my head. It was easy since all Uma's orders ran through me anyway. I recalled that I sold that hat to a thick Jamaican girl named Shirley. She was easy enough to remember. The first time I met her was on a day of the baby shower. For a long time, she never placed an order with Uma Designs, but she would always wave and smile when she saw me. When I grew some more, she would stop and speak to me while I waited for Uma to come downstairs. She had a thick Jamaican accent, which I had to strain to understand, and a bold style. She wore her clothes real tight, revealing how her legs swung back and gave her an unusual stance. Finally, one day she ordered some hats for me. We went back and forth on the price and the exact shade of green she wanted Uma to stitch. I showed her about seven different variations of the color before she agreed. She said the hats were for her fiancé and described him as being quote-unquote real choosy. She claimed that she got the color wrong by even a little bit. He wouldn't wear the hats at all. She joked that she liked my quiet, easy-going style better than his loud demands and wanting everything his way. She shot me a sly look and said she would marry me if my age would just catch up with my body. Her eyes lingered on me to check if I caught her compliment. I just laughed at the time, thought it was funny. A female choosing me and then telling me she would marry me like I had no say-so in it? The last time I delivered Shirley some hats that she had ordered was the last time I saw her. Uma says she quit the job all of a sudden. A few months later, a few months before her scheduled wedding, her co-workers speculated on what happened with her because no one got a chance to say their goodbyes or had received a wedding invite or even a friendly call. I waited and watched the cat as he looked around the parking lot. He never made a move that night. None of the workers stepped up to meet him to say hi or to catch a ride in his car. He stayed at a distance, just leaning against his car and watching me watching him. When Uma came down, we left. He chilled right there. The next evening, he rolled up again at five. It was impossible to miss that pale yellow Fairmount station wagon that leaned heavier on one side than the other and oddly had wood paneling on the outside of the car. If he was supposed to be incognito, that sh** wasn't working out too well. The third night, he showed up. He was still focused in my direction. When Uma came downstairs and joined me, he stopped leaning on his car, stood up straight, and for some reason removed his hat, his locks falling down around his face like a lion's mane. He shook them one good time and struck a pose like an animal after a mating dance. What are you staring at? Uma asked me. 
Nothing, I responded, placing my hand behind her elbow and moving us away from his view and on our way. In my mind, I was thinking that this man must be thinking that one day he would show up and I wouldn't be there. Then he would seize his opportunity to swoop down on my mother. Then I told myself, nah. Why would he be here for Uma? I mean, there were all these other women walking through with either really tight or revealing clothing. Why would he be checking out the one woman wearing a loose-fitting Islamic dress whose face and body he could not see at all? On Friday, the fifth day of his strange appearances, he sat in his station wagon and waited for Uma to come downstairs to meet me. He exited his car, dressed in the Rust Wrangler corduroy suit, brown Clark Weavers, a red, yellow, and green belt, and a hat that looked like a beaver tilted sideways. He walked over to us, his steps sideways like his hat. Purposely, I waited eager to find out his intent. I stepped in front of Uma so that she was directly behind me. Wait one minute, Uma. I opened my coat so he could see I was holding. I mind respect that, he said. Overstand, he added, smiling ear to ear. What you need? I asked him, unfamiliar with whatever he was saying. I my need for chat with she for a minute, he said, leaning to the side to try to catch Uma's eyes and attract her attention. But I was taller than her, and she didn't step out from behind me. Talk to me, I told him. He reached his hand behind him into his back pocket. I pulled out my joint and held it at my side where no one but him could see it. Hold on, wait, man, I'm man, a paying customer, he said, calmly opening the paper he just pulled out from his back pocket. Why come it always have a come down to fire power between brethren? he asked, but I didn't flinch. Me, I want for she to put the line of Judah on a man's shirt. I man know she could do what I man want. I man checks who my styles man. Wicked, he said, his smile revealing his slow, sly manner and smoker's teeth. Whatever I man wants from Uma Designs, I man needs to talk only to me, I told him. Believing my now, his name was I man, or I man. He corrected me, telling me that his name was Gold Star Tafari. He pushed each of the names out like he was pronouncing something sacred or announcing the arrival of a king. I later found out that Iman or Iman was his way of saying me, referring to himself. Uma embroidered a gold Lion of Judah on the back of his deep blue denim shirt with all of the detail and power presented on the picture that he had handed to me that night outside the factory. When I called him to let him know that his shirt was ready, he offered to meet Uma at her job. I told him forcefully that he should not return there since his business was only with me. He chuckled. We met. I gave him the shirt wrapped in our packaging. He paid. I gave him a receipt. After I thanked him for his business, I turned to leave. All on, he said. He tore open the package right in front of me. He held the denim shirt up, then laid it down on the wrapping paper and ran his thick, rough, ashy hands over the hand-embroidered designs and shouted, Wicked! Selassie! I could tell that was some kind of vote of approval. I nodded and asked him, You good? He answered, Uma is good. I started feeling tight, so I left. Less than 24 hours later, his deep voice and strange talk cut through on a voicemail. I'm on what? Uma embroidered a line of Judah on the pant leg of his jeans. I charged him double what he paid for the embroidery on his shirt. We met at a vegetarian spot called the Green Onion on Nostrand Avenue in Brooklyn. He paid for the package. I gave him the receipt, thanked him, and left. His next voicemail was directed at Uma. It was crazy hearing his voice saying her name. 
Uma. Uma was the name that only our family called her. Even though her business was named Uma Designs, her first name is actually Sana. I might want to thank you personally, Uma. I might have a special project just for you, Uma, he said. I played his message three times. I never allowed Uma to hear it, of course, but now I was thinking of this cat as some real threat. A nutcase who knew where my mother worked and didn't mind taking the time to come up to her job looking around and waiting for her. I waited to return this call. I had to let my anger pass. When I called Gold Star Tafari back, he said he needed to have Uma come over personally to do some measurements for some custom design curtains for his apartment. He was pushing it. I knew he wanted to get my mother inside his apartment within his reach and control. By now, I could tell that he would try anything. He was always calm though, which f***ed with me even more. So I played his game. I made an appointment for Uma to take the measurements and took his home address. I was glad to know where he lived. Even though he did not know where we lived, he already knew too much about my family, I thought. He lived in Brooklyn, in the corner building at the end of the block directly across the street from Prospect Park on Ocean Avenue and Parkside, over there down by the playgrounds. When I knocked, he pulled his door open slowly. I could hear the metal pole dragging against a metal slide as the door opened. It was an old school police lock where a metal pole leans against the closed door making it impossible for anyone to enter without that pole being removed. Even if someone was successful in breaking into an apartment with one of these locks, the noise that the metal made would expose the intruder instantly. When I stepped inside the dim living room, I could see his huge candles burning. I heard his soft music playing reggae sounds by Marley's voice. I don't want to wait in vain for your love. I could tell that this was a typical approach for him. His thick cylinder candles were burnt down more than halfway. There was already three inches worth of hardened wax stuck around their bottoms. His big f***ing welcome smile evaporated when he realized it was me, not Uma, and that she wasn't even with me. I acted like he did, calm and casual. I walked in with the tape measure draped around my neck. I had disregarded his instructions the way he disregarded mine. Turn on the lights so I could get your measurements right, I told him. After taking the measurements and ignoring his screw face, I quoted a price for the curtains that I thought would permanently end his relationship with Uma Designs. $3,000. I quoted him for the white burlap drapes he wanted with the brocade borders and the line of Judah embroidered on each section. Irie, he said, but I didn't know what that meant. So I started explaining and breaking down to him why my price was so high. 500 covers only the material and supplies. It's handmade. The material you want is heavy and expensive. The embroidery process will take much longer than usual. No problem, my youth. Irie. Which I now knew meant something like, okay, or that's cool. He left his living room space and walked into some back room. I was standing there in disbelief that he was going to pay out the ridiculous price I only came up with to get rid of him for good. I looked around his little bachelor pad. Behind where I was standing on the wall was a five-foot-long horizontal fluorescent poster of the silhouette of a naked black woman lying down on her side. She had wide hips, a small waist, and titties the size of honeydew melons. It was just the outline of a female's body. She had no skin, no eyes, or nose, or mouth even. But she did have two afros. One big, and one small. He had ashtrays everywhere, filled with cigarette butts and reefer seeds and roaches. 
Gold beads hung in each doorway, dividing one room from the other. His lamp sat on top of old Guinness Stout crates instead of tables. His extensive hat collection lined one of the walls, each hanging on its own nail. There was no family photos or even a sign of a woman's scent or touch. There were no heels or dresses or bangles or perfumes or fresh-cut flowers. I thought to myself that he probably erases every trace of each woman after he uses her. I imagined that this was his second apartment. Somehow I felt he had a bunch of random girls and random babies, people who he had abandoned. But I did not know for sure. I decided I should stop being so tight and talk to this cat for a minute. At least I could be smart enough to collect some more information on him. He came back holding a machete. He was using it to cut slices of an apple he had began eating. The blade was long and sharp enough to sever his entire hand with one wrong motion. I seen everything he did was slick and subtle. There was no fear in my heart. I was holding enough weapons on me to slice him up in pieces smaller than that apple he's eaten. He watched to see if I would react in any way to his blade. I didn't blink. $1,500 for the deposit, I told him dryly and calmly. He laughed a little, placed his knife and apple on his heavy wooden table right next to two decks of playing cards, a pile of chew sticks, and a half-empty bottle of white rum. He kept his eyes on me, and he slid his hand into his right pocket, pulling out a wad of dirty bills. He counted out loud in his version of the English language. Seemed like he had a dramatic and different way of pronouncing every English word, tree instead of three, and so on. I took the cash deposit he handed over to me. Thank you. I'll give you a call as soon as your curtains are ready. You want to sit down here? You look tense, man. Seckle yourself. You want to blow some cheese? He asked. What? I asked. Hold on. Barefooted, he left again. He came back with two big spliffs burning, both of them in his mouth. Try and calm down, nah. Huh? He offered me one, which he now held pinched between his thumb and index finger, smiling at me like I was his new friend. Nah, I'm good, I told him, rejecting his weed. But I'm on cutting complete. We celebrate sin? He laughed and he began smoking both spliffs. I left. I didn't know what his occupation or business was, but I was starting to form a picture in my mind. Uma was excited about earning the money for the curtains and moving closer to our financial goals. I should have been happy too, but I was heated. Do you know this man? I asked her with an even and respectful tone. No. You never met him before? I double-checked. No. Is there some problem? If there's a problem, we don't have to do business with him, she answered. No problem, Uma. I just want to make sure he talks business with me and doesn't talk to you at all, I said. I don't want him going anywhere near your job. Of course, she said gently. One late night on the basketball court alone, I thought about how uneasy I felt about this guy because he knew where my mother worked. Whether I dropped him as a client or not, he would still always know exactly where to go to get at her. I also knew that what he really wanted was hidden behind his constant request for sewing services. Weeks later, when I spoke to Gold on the phone to set up the curtain delivery, his intensity towards my mother had only increased. He requested that I bring her with me to his place because the curtains had to get hung. He tried to keep me from hanging the curtains myself by insulting my manhood. Y'all yeah, know that's woman's work. I fired back. Uma Designs is only contracted to make your drapes. The product is ready and in perfect condition. You or your woman can hang the drapes. He chuckled. Irie, he said.
Gold Star Tafari didn't have my money ready when I knocked on his door at the agreed upon time. This was the first indication that this transaction wasn't about to flow right. Come in now. Nah. He said, releasing the doorknob from his grip so that the heavy door pressed against me and the iron bar dragged against the metal as I carried in the well-packaged drapes. Where do you want these? I asked. He gave no response and left the room, disappearing behind the gold beads. I sat the package down on his couch and remained standing. Instantly, I noticed three piles of neatly stacked cash on his heavy wooden table. I stayed where I was standing because I sensed the setup and didn't want to be accused of touching his paper. There was a bag of weed beside his money stacks, at least a pound of it, and there was a weed cloud hanging over the wooden table. He returned barefooted with his jeans on and his shirt open. He had a scar running down from his chest to his stomach as though somebody tried to split him open once. Not a doctor. It was a raggedy scar writ with vengeance and passion. Why good is the curtains them without the couch to match? I might need a new covering for me chairs them. Same material. Line of Judah on each one of them, overstand, he said, pointing toward his couch and chairs. Nah, she can't do it, I said. Tired of the game he was playing and not giving a fuck about the extra money a new deal with him could bring. Be reasonable, sire, he said, lighting a cigarette. He took a long pull. Releasing the smoke, he asked, You have a girlfriend? I didn't respond, because it wasn't about business. He continued. Woman is a good thing, my youth. Like a sweet potato. Fifteen hundred is what you owe me right now. We can discuss the upholstery some other time, I told him, fighting to remain calm and professional. Look over there, sir, he said, pointing at a crate on the floor next to the couch. I looked with my eyes, but didn't break my stance. You want is in there, check and see, he said. Then he sat down at his table across the room. I walked over and looked down into the crate. There was an envelope inside. You want me to take that envelope? I asked to double check that there was no trap, no mistake. Go on now, he said. So I picked up the envelope. I could tell there was more than money in it, so I opened it up right there in his face. There was cash, a heap of ones, fives, tens, and twenties. His bills were crumpled up and dirty as usual. There were also some photos. I pulled the photos out. You must have made a mistake. You got some pictures in here, I told him, extending my arm to return them. I, man, never make no mistakes, he said. Look upon the pictures, man. I flipped them over and took a look. There were five pictures, all of them of Uma, each one prettier than the last. She was dressed up and beautiful. Her smile was radiant. Her hair was exposed, as well as her shapely body and elegant face, natural and just incredible. An anger so strong built up inside me from my toes to my head. It was like a wave from the ocean gaining a deadly and unstoppable momentum. A wave with a powerful undercurrent and dangerous riptides. It kept me from thinking straight like I normally would do. I was trained to control my anger. Yet my training seemed to be failing me now. I stood, boiling, yet frozen, in that same spot, remembering a line from a book my sensei once gave me called The Art of War. The line was, War is deception. I kept saying the line over and over again in my head to calm myself down. I man want to make Uma I man's wife. This thing is a serious thing, man. What I man have to do make I see I man serious. What you need, star? Is it money? Eh? I man have good and plenty. He pushed a stack of bills forward on the wooden table. I was still calming myself down. I didn't say nothing. Cha, you want more? He asked and pushed a second stack of bills forward. 
It's not possible, I said politely. Nothing is impossible. Everything at a price, Sin, he said, pushing the third stack forward. Look around, Sin. Me trade for anything you see in here. Then he threw his bag of weed over at me like it wasn't nothing. It fell to the floor by my feet. Mr. Tafari, I have the 1500 here in the envelope. That's the balance. That makes 3000 Now we're straight. Uma is not for sale. Do you need a receipt? I asked him without exposing any emotions. He banged the table with his fist, finally losing his cool. Me not want no blood clot receipt. Give eye and eye from pictures, them and go. How much do you want for the pictures? I asked him calmly, throwing his style back the same way he threw it out there. He gave me a deadly look. For the first time, he had no smile and no chuckle, and his temper was brewing. He wouldn't answer me. Evil looks didn't mean sh** to me. So I left with the 1500 and the photos. There was nothing chasing me but a chorus of his curses. I left him throwing a tantrum that could have been recorded on top of some rough-ass Jamaican sound system beats. He left some recordings of his own on my voicemail. Again, he sounded as though he was speaking directly to Uma. He left 12 messages, to be exact, over a one-week period of time. He showed up at Uma's job Friday at 4 p.m., one hour earlier than she usually got off work. But I anticipated his plan and had been waiting for Uma each day of that week, beginning at 3 p.m. and sitting until 5, just in case. I realized that I was the one who had influenced Uma to attend her co-worker's baby shower. I was the one who had encouraged her to dress up in her most elegant way. I was the one who made her feel like it was all right for her to shine, to let down her hair, to relax and enjoy herself and show the potential female clients the true secret of Sudanese beauty. I was the one who slipped the expensive heels on her feet. I was the one who pushed her to reveal her incredible talents. I now realized that this was the only way that Gold Star Tafari got his hands on the photographs of Uma's exquisiteness. Putting the pieces together, I remembered Shirley was at the baby shower that day. She must have snapped those photos. Gold was wearing one of the hats I sold to Shirley. That's probably how he got his hands on those photos. He probably glanced at the photos casually and never revealed the depth of his lust to Shirley, his fiancée. That's when he began to put together his plan to bypass and deceive Shirley and capture my Uma. Setting up in the woods of Prospect Park seven nights later was easy. In the bushes, wearing all black on a black night, no one could see my black face, my black gloves over my black hands, or my black gun. I screwed on my black silencer, paid for with a portion of the cash from Gold's envelope. I waited three hours in the cold. Only my thoughts kept me heated. When Gold Star Tafari walked around the corner at 1.06 a.m. after parking his yellow station wagon, I clapped him up nice. The line of Judah got took down by the leopard of Sudan. War is deception, I thought to myself. No sense in being sloppy. Think through shit. Control your anger. Make a tight plan and execute it. Sorry folks, but we gotta take a pause for the cause just because I need you to tune in to the next edition of Ralph Reads, 
I would like, or rather love, to thank you, queens and kings, fellow royalty, for stopping by. You may connect with me via Facebook, send a friend request to Ralph Anthony Garcia on Twitter and Instagram at RGMC2407. Send an email to RGMC2407 at gmail.com, where if you like to leave a small donation, please use the Zelle app or paypal.me forward slash RGMC2407 or Cash App. My cash tag is RGMC2407. You may also connect with me on my other channel, my music channel, RGMC2407, and right here on T-U-R-N. Tell a friend to tell a friend to tune in to the United Ronin Networks. We are Ronin. Fellow royalty, pick up a good book, read a good story, and set your good self free. I appreciate you, and I love you like cooked food. I will see you folks on a continuation of this Sister Soldier miniseries on Ralph Reads. Keep your head all the way up, folks, but remember to also watch your back.